Good afternoon. Who's awake? Yes. Hands up. Okay, I'm going to do some physical exercises later. Why is it my bloody luck that every time I go after somebody who's diff <laughs> So a few years ago, I went after David Snowden. So how do you follow that up? How do you follow this up? Now we're going back to the slides and somebody talking at you. So anyway, my name is Dragan. I'm an agile coach, consultant, trainer. I have been independent, worked for a small consultancy organization called Rattak, and I've gone back independent a couple of months ago. So I work with a number of different companies, clients. I've been around for a while, as you could probably tell by the lack of the hair and what's left being pretty gray and white. So I'm going to talk to you today about rising to the agility challenge. And I have so many stories I would like to tell you, but the time is limited. So I'll just go into the one of the things that inspired me or kind of linked into this. I have not done this talk before, so it's going to be anything but perfect. And I'm hoping that's OK with everybody. So I came across this statement a few years ago. Dave Gray, I don't know who's familiar with Dave Gray, anybody? He's the guy who did game storming and then subsequently to this wrote a book called uh, Connected Company and he has just come up with another book called Liminal Thinking which is highly recommended and we liked it so much we named our uh, network of coaches Be Liminal. So uh, really good guy. He said let's be honest. You don't know what's going to happen to your industry. That's why you need to turn your organization, build your organization as the engine of possibility. What does that mean? Whatever happens out there, you should be able to respond. And that's what the real agile company is. That's what agility is. It's responsiveness, it's flexibility, um, there was another term for it, I can't remember, but it'll come to me again. Okay, so this is from his article that came out in Fast Company, on fastcompany.com, called Experimentation is the New Planning. Okay? So this article is one of the inputs into this talk, but the key input into the talk is the article I wrote for InfoQ. It was published in February this year. I seem to write when I get frustrated about something, and in the earlier session, my frustration was, why does nobody care about the delivery capability? Why does nobody seem to care how much we as an organization can deliver? Most of my clients, when I ask them a question, they blank out. How much can we actually deliver? So I wrote an article that kind of touches on that. But there's a couple of other influences. So we can't avoid talking about that Swedish streaming service and the stuff that they do and how they call things. Um, also, I came across a tweet by a friend of mine, an old colleague of mine called Carl Scotland, that directed me to his blog. That linked me up to the book called The Art of Action. That is another input into this that I'll talk about a bit more later. And finally, when you meet somebody inspirational, it stays with you forever, well, at least for me, with me. So I met this chap 20 odd years ago and his words still resonate with me, so I'll touch on that as well. And I'll bring all of these things together and hopefully at some point, five minutes before the end, we'll talk about leadership. Maybe a bit more. Okay, so there's this continuum between alignment and autonomy. And I showed this to my 15 year old son the other day. He says, surely you need to be somewhere in the middle. Where are you guys? How many of you are on the alignment side? We know what we need to achieve and why. How many of your companies are closer to the alignment? Show of hands. So if you are closer to the alignment, how many of you are closer to the autonomy side? And then the rest of them, somewhere, you somewhere in the middle? It's actually a trick question, it's a false question because those two are not the opposites. Those two are not, this is not a continuum. This is how it looks like. 
okay? So you can be aligned and autonomous. You can have clarity about what needs to be achieved and why, and you have autonomy to choose what to do to achieve it and how. And that is, in fact, what Spotify calls loosely coupled, tightly aligned. And that, needless to say, is top right. For my sins, I worked with quite a few organizations that I strongly believe are in the bottom left. They're not autonomous, the teams are not autonomous, and they actually don't know what they're supposed to do and why. And in fact, I'm going to throw this in. So I worked, I, I went to see this company, and in the, on the first day I spoke to one of the guys there, and I said, well, describe, describe your delivery teams. He said, our delivery teams are, the, are like scared cells of death. Those words. <laughs> I ended up working with them for about three years, off and on. So, anyways. So that's how it looks like. In fact, Henrik Nyberg, I came up across this the other day, so I thought I'll just chuck it in. This is how he shows it. So I thought that was quite coincidental and happy coincidence. Okay, so you need to be in the, on the side or on in the top right, which he calls aligned autonomy. Okay, here's the problem. We need to cross the river. What's the best way to do? You're experts. Figure out what to do. That's the aligned autonomy. Okay. So, the agility challenge. This is how I define where you need to be, to be an agile organization, to be an agile enterprise. Everybody in an agile enterprise, I, I thought I would give myself a challenge to not use agile word too, word too many times, but I failed already. So everybody in an agile enterprise, everybody in a successful company needs to know what they need to achieve and why. So that's the direction. That is our alignment, right? Everybody in a successful organization needs to be able to decide for themselves how to do it. So that's the autonomy bit. But there's one thing missing. Everybody in the organization needs to care that it gets done. And that is commitment. And it doesn't work without either of these. OK? So, so great. So we just go there, and we become an agile enterprise. But herein lies the problem. Steve Blank came up. I believe he came up with this term called organizational debt. He says organizational debt is like technical debt, just worse. OK? So, he describes it as something slightly different. He looks at it from the startup position and is the legacy the startup accumulates as they grow. Because most of my clients are established traditional organizations, I see it slightly differently. I think it's really the gap between the customer needs and market realities. So this is what's out there. This is what we should be doing. And our strategy and our delivery capability. Okay, I had to throw in a, uh, a gorge of some description because I went rafting a couple of weeks ago on the, uh, on the river in Montenegro. It's not that, but it doesn't matter. It says nice. Okay, so organizational debt. But there's two other things that really hold us back, and those are the structure and the culture. And this is, a, again, the quote that I picked up from... Uh, from the article in Times, what is it, a year ago or so? Okay, so structural inertia and cultural inertia. And I really like this statement, if the, stuff if the world around us changes faster than we change, we're probably close to death. We're going to die. We're not going to survive. Okay? So, Here's where the military theory and practice comes into place. So this is my The Art of Action book that I'm still reading, and I find it really, really interesting, and I found this model. I looked at this model and I thought, hmm, I could use this. So I did, I stole it, borrowed it, whatever, repurposed it. So he says, he's actually been studying, um, he's really interested in military and battles, and he went back and studied Prussian, so this is pre-German, 
military history from 1807, I believe it is, when they were, be, when they were destroyed by the French army. And what they did to restructure their army and completely change the culture of the officer corps in the Prussian army. So this is a story from um, 1807 to 1870 and um, builds on uh, the teachings, writings of two of the officers. One's a general, the other one is field marshal and subsequently became chief of staff of the army. Von Clausewitz, if I pronounce it right, and uh, oh my god, I forgot the other name, and another guy. Uh, and he says, they have come up with this concept of friction. Why are things difficult to do? Why are things difficult to change? Why are we difficult to respond to the changing environment? Is because of these three gaps. So the first one is the knowledge gap. It's the gap between what, we, what is out there, again, the reality, market realities in our case, and customer expectations, customer needs, and what we know. So this is the gap in what we know. And if we were to know everything, then there's the second gap, which is the alignment gap. So if we were to make perfect plans, we need to communicate them and get people to act in accordance with those plans. So that's the alignment gap. And then if we do that, there's an effects gap. And when we do stuff, there's no guarantee it will achieve what we wanted it to achieve. Okay, so there's three gaps that are making it difficult to achieve what we want to achieve. So, guess what the usual reaction, usual response to these three gaps is? Can anybody guess? Denial. Sorry? Denial. Uh, no, it's more stuff. We need to know more. We need to describe more, document more, we need to control more. So knowledge gap, we need more detailed information. Alignment gap, we need more detailed instructions. Effects gap, we need more control. Okay, more me measures, more targets. So when we get into this cycle, my visual representation would be this starts expanding. So I worked, I worked with a customer where uh, they spent more than a year documenting stuff that they thought they needed to do. And then I went to India to audit their teams for their agile capability. So I went and audited the teams. That's completely irrelevant because a month and a half after that, they canceled the project. So they, they spent a year and a half trying to bridge the knowledge gap and then close the project. That's not very clever, is it? The bottom one, I always remember, I can never, when I was a project manager in the olden days, I could never work with the plans that are more than, I don't know, 50, 60 tasks. I could never understand the plans that spend over a number of pages. Why do we need that? Who's going to follow it? And who's going to maintain it? And the top left one, I remember one of the banking customers that I worked with that, um, they were producing a peer-to-peer -peer money transfer mobile app. Every afternoon at 6.30, the COO had a progress meeting with everybody involved with that project. Now, how autonomous is that? Okay. So that's the usual response. And I'm, I bet everybody here has seen that response, right? What's the unusual response? The unusual response is exactly the opposite. It's counterintuitive. You do less information. You just define the intent. What do we want to achieve? You communicate that intent and allow each level in the organization, so delivery teams, call them squads or maybe they're tribes, let them figure out what they need to do to achieve that. And then give them freedom to adjust their actions. It's not only adjusting their actions that couldn't fit it there to look nice. It's not just adjusting their actions to the intent. It's adjusting their actions to the, to the real feedback they're getting from the market, from, from the customers, from the feedback that they're getting 
based on what they're doing. If you need to go around that cycle again, it's slow. You need to respond to the feedback immediately. And this is what's coming from the military theory, from the Prussian army. The officers on the battlefield knew what the intent was, but they were, in, they were encouraged to choose what to do next based on the situation. So it rains now, we'll do something different. The enemy did this, we'll do something different. They didn't go back to the headquarters to get the instructions. They were encouraged to, to be creative and to take responsibility. Okay? So, Stephen Bungay, who's the guy who wrote the book, calls this directed opportunism. NATO calls it mission control. It's very well established in the armies of the world now. And Stephen is arguing it, it should be, it is very useful to bring into the business. So that's that on the model. How am I doing? 15 minutes, not bad. So, this is where my distinguished after dinner speaker comes in. So I met this guy, I had the pleasure to sit next to him at an event about 20, God knows how many years ago. His name is my, uh, Tony Bell. He's the father of the singer and actor Michael Bell. And he's a former chairman, chairman of British Leyland and probably a few other companies. So I can't remember if he was doing that as part of his talk or he was telling that to me, but he was talking about three C's of success in life. And none of them is a four-letter word. So he says, commitment, confidence, communication. We're not necessarily born committed, but within the first few years of our life, probably combination of nature and nurture, we either end up committed or not. We either care or we couldn't give a damn. And probably then when we get into an organization, the organization, any organization, conditions us further to care or not to care. Okay? But in life, you are committed or you're not committed. You either care about you, people around you, the world, or you don't. So it's kind of a given. Confidence, he says, gets knocked out of you, and then you regain it. You keep on going up and down with the confidence. And he says, you're never good enough with communication. And you can see that right now. A live example. You're never good enough with communication. You have to keep on improving. So I thought, well, hang on. I've no idea how I came up with this. But how does this map onto my agility challenge? So let's have a look. So everybody needs to know what they need to achieve and why. Everybody needs to be able to do, to choose what to do to achieve it. Everybody needs to care. So that's commitment, confidence, communication. Confidence to do what you think is right. Confidence on the level of the many, on, at the level of the management to let you do, to trust you to do what you think is appropriate, right? And then I looked at this and I thought, there's something missing. Uh, I thought, wh wh where's this understanding of the external environment? Where's this understanding of the customer and what we need to do? So that why and why, really, I kind of exploded it into another thing. And then I thought, how do I call this? And I thought, comprehension, but that's a really clunky word. And I spoke to a number of people the day before last, in the evening, over a beer, as you do. And the word that kept on being mentioned was curiosity. So I thought, that word describes it quite nicely. So I have curiosity, communication, confidence, and commitment. So what? Well, they kind of nicely map onto, these, map onto these gaps. So maybe those four C's of success map onto these gaps and could help us close those gaps. So curiosity leads us to explore and figure out and understand what it is that is out there. What's the reality? What do our customers need? But also, what can we do? So there's an external and internal element. That gap, I think, is the widest, the most difficult to bridge. Then the communication, we communicate that intent with clarity and we possibly communicate some of the measures. The confidence is, as I said, confidence to make decisions on what needs to be done and then go and do it. And commitment is bang in the middle kind of brings it all together. So, I have a feeling I'm going very, very fast through this, so I'm going to slow down now. 
So how does leadership come into all of this? So a former colleague of mine at Rattak used to say, agile makes organizations work, leadership makes agile work. And I quite like that. So without leadership, you have nothing. But what kind of leadership is that? So David Anderson in Kanban Method says, he talks about leadership at all levels in the organization. Encourage leadership at all levels in the organization. Okay. And uh, here's two quotes. John Cotter talks about, so he's the, uh, the change guy. He talks about leadership is about taking initiative and influencing those around you. Those around you, not those below you. So we're not talking about leadership by charismatic CEOs, COOs, CXOs, whatever. Everybody. And the second one is uh, David Marquette. He was the captain of a submarine in the American Army, American Navy even, and turned that submarine from the worst to the best by what he calls intent-based <coughs> leadership. So he says, be a leader from the position you are in. It's your responsibility. Everybody in the organization has the right and the responsibility to lead. So that's what kind of leadership we're talking about. Okay, so. So that's what we said. Agility challenge, the four C's of success, the four C's of leadership and how they map. So let's look at them one by one. Curiosity, I love quotes. Often when I do I don't know, Scrum or Kanban or any Agile training, people say, well, what's the key thing? And to me, key thing is do less. Do less, but do what matters. So to know what matters, you need to look, listen, and learn. Brian Robertson from Holacracy One talks about people in the organization being measuring instruments that observe what's happening see things, see opportunities or risks, and react to them. So nobody can know everything. We all need to be those sensing instruments. We all need to look what is happening and do something about it. So that's the look, listen, and learn thing. Um, and, and, and at that level, so we're talking about outcomes and plans, you look at the strategic options. What could we be doing? and then run experiments. Many people over the last day and a half, almost two days, talked about experiments. Run experiments, measure outcomes. Learn, cycle. Okay? Keep everything visible. Another thing that uh, whenever I talk about Kanban, Kanban to me is visualizing everything. Visualizing the process, the work, the progress, the impediments, everything. And this is at every level in the organization. And then, I mentioned this earlier, in our little group while the music was playing, converting the push to pull. And this is really, really crucial because I, I did the training the, a couple of months ago with a great group of people and we were talking about stuff and it was all going brilliantly until somebody said midway through the morning on the second day, but we can't do this, why can't you do this? Because we always have more work. The work gets pushed onto us. So somewhere in the organization, I thought there needs to be somebody who's a damn master who converts this push into pull. But that's not enough. It really needs to go throughout the organization. This is really about visualizing and understanding your delivery capability. How much can we do? Let's be honest to ourselves. We can do this much. What do we need to do next? What's the most important thing to do next? What is possible with the means we have at our disposal? So, as I said right at the beginning, this is as far from perfection as possible. So, I have four slides and four C's. I'd really like to hear from you if you can think of anything else that I missed that would be relevant for this particular gap. That was a leadership behavior that would help us close this gap. Any suggestions? 
show me that you're not asleep, please. <laughs> Ask questions. Ask questions. Yeah, it's another book on my list. Humble inquiry. Anything else? Ask questions. Ask questions. Listen to the answers. Listen what lies behind the answers. Follow up. Show to the person who answered that you listened and that you're going to do something about it. The worst thing, ask question, get the answer, ignore it. So who was talking about, it was, um, what's the name, the lady, the Fortworks lady this morning was talking about. No sex, which one? I won't use it, promise. <laughs> um, what was the name of the Fortworks lady that was talking this morning? Rebecca. Rebecca was talking about granularity, I can't even say it, granularity and the importance of granularity. So. Make them smaller, those pieces of work that you're trying to do, that you're planning to do, that you're working on, make them smaller. Stop starting, start finishing. Don't you run the risk of oversimplifying? Always. Because sometimes things are complicated, and sometimes there are things that need complex solutions, or sometimes... I've, I've sometimes got the feeling that a lot of this... I mean, this, is, this came up a couple of times. There, there, there is a reason why it should have approach, but there's also a also, as Rebecca says, certain things that need to be decided up front, certain things that need to be the big picture, not only in, in order to be able to find the least you can do, you need to do a lot of work. So that's the wisdom then, figuring out what are the things that you absolutely need to do up front and what are the things that you can leave for later. And try to minimize the amount of things that you're going to do up front always push yourself, challenge yourself. Can we finish now? Is that enough? Um, a, a former client of mine used to say, it's good enough for now. Is it good enough for now? Does it give us a base, a stepping stone to keep going? But you're absolutely right. We can't just start. Are we ready to sprint? We can't just start going. It's another thing that I stole from somewhere, but nobody claimed it, so I'm claiming it as mine that I have on the last slide that we'll get to, which will come. No, it's not anything clever. It's just uh, another quote. Right. This is why. It doesn't say why. It doesn't, does it? I know you talked about it, but you know, I think that, that probably is the key word. Yeah. Yeah, this is about why. Yeah. You're absolutely right. So I need to inject it somewhere. I would say, like, to seek inspirations as well. If you talk about curiosity, you need inspirations. Mm -hmm. and you need to change the context. You need to change the system. Not stay within the same system. Because that's, that's what really gets you to change the mm. system. So, so you kind of get out of your comfort zone? Uh, yeah, just, it's, it's not Look broader. Just, just go somewhere else. Mm. Somewhere you don't Change the perspective. Yeah. This is, I suppose, where innovation becomes injected. It's been yeah. another buzzword of today. Lots of people saying innovate, innovate. It's going to come from curiosity. Yeah, which is exactly why I like the word curiosity much more than the word comprehension. Because it's opening ourselves up. We want to learn. We want to see things from somebody else's perspective. OK. The communication. So this is communicate the ends is the why. What do we want to achieve and why? Communicate that. Communicate that clearly. So, so here's, interestingly enough, why has some, somehow dropped into this slide. So knowing why we're doing something is the key to making good, good decisions, says my compatriot. And um, 
And it is true. This is the alignment bit. This is all of us pointing in the same direction. We may get there in different times, in different ways, but we need to be aiming for the same place. Okay. So communicate ends and leave the means to the ones closest to the customer. How wonderful it is when you call a call center. American Express, for me, is a reasonably good example. You call a call center and you have a problem and the person on the other side solves it. Rather than saying, I can't help you, sir. So the person closest to the customer figures out how to address your problem. Um, and then identify the useful metrics, not many, a few useful metrics that show we are successful or we aren't successful. So useful, my mantra has been over the last 12 to 18 months, useful over right. I don't particularly care if they're right or wrong. Are they useful to us in what we're trying to achieve? What's a useful metric? Again, to me, a useful metric does two things. It highlights the need for intervention. When do we need to do something about it? And it encourages desired behaviors. That's a useful metric. So anything that encourages behaviors that we don't want to see is not particularly useful. OK? I must have missed loads of things here. Can you think of anything useful? I didn't do it deliberately to test you. You say leave the means to those places the customer does, I think to the salespeople. That's an interesting question. <laughs> well, these are the means to do things. Do you know any salesmen that have ever done anything? Sorry. I know lots of salesmen who think they know the means to do things. But this goes back to our delivery capability as the organization. It's not about the management, the business, and the IT. It's about us as a whole. What can we do? Please don't sell what we can't do, either because we don't know how to, or because we're doing something else at the moment. And it's rather important. So there has to be that knowledge across the organization. We're doing these things. This is what we're doing now. Well, maybe it's the means should be the person that's doing the work. Which in your case, the person that's doing, is the person that's it's the per person. You're absolutely, the person that's doing the work for that customer. And it may well be the salesman, but it may well be a developer, a tester, a, a team. OK? Anything else burning? Well, I think you say communicate the ends, but you need to check that that communication is real. Uh, so when... You need to check that people have understood. I remember the other German or Prussian field marshal, von Moltke. Uh, he talks about back briefing. Mm -hmm. So the units on the field, battlefield, <laughs> are actually back briefing what they're going to do to achieve the intent. And it may well be completely different from what the original plan said, but that's fine. Okay, so that's the back briefing. There's a, there's a quote, I forget who by, but it's something along the lines of, I should get right, it's a quote, but um, the biggest problem with communication is the assumption that it's happened. Oh, okay. So, you know, you can communicate something, it doesn't need to say that it's happened, or it's done the it's done the So, be clear with that communication. We're on the way, we haven't got there yet. I, my observation on the last point, Um, that may well be right, or I, I see it more here. So this is the doing <coughs> bit. This is us as a delivery unit taking that communication on the intent and doing something with it. So I stole the first bullet. So, so to start with, I love that quote. The first bullet I stole from uh, Eben and his stream talk on awesome teams yesterday. So articulate norms, how should we behave? Principles, norms. And de delineate authority. When he started talking about delineate, whatever, delineating authority, I thought he was, he was going to go into defining roles within the team. And I feel really nervous about that. 
because I, I think that creates divisions rather than unites the team. He was talking about authority of the team, authority of the commander on the battlefield. What can you do? Okay, so define that. And then based on that, again, second, third reference on Kanban method, when you have policies, if you will, then you know your constraints and you can keep each other honest. You can say, well, hang on, we agreed, we will do this. So team agreements, team contracts, whatever you call them. Uh, who was talking about providing feedback, nonviolent communication yesterday? Uh, I saw you do this. Adam, Adam I, saw you, I, I saw you doing this. That made me feel like this. It would be helpful if next time, blah. So keep each other honest in a non-violent way. The other thing I really like is the Uda thing. I don't know why I'm not particularly keen on, on army and battles and wars and stuff. But quite a lot of the things that I'm picking up are from the military side. So Uda is by the um, uh, American fight, fighter pilot, John Boyd. So observe, orient, decide, act, loop. And you need to whiz through that loop as quickly as possible, quicker than the enemy. Quicker than the enemy pilot in order to survive and win that battle. Mm. So observe, look for risks and opportunities. Orientate, check the alignment. Are we still in alignment with the intent? Communicate the intent, gather input, and then decide and act is, again, hypothesis is another word that kept on cropping up during our talks, set the hypothesis, do stuff to, in order to test it and cycle through that loop. So do stuff, do stuff and then check the results. Measure the results, learn, adjust. Seek and provide input. Uh, again, that's, that's kind of from uh, David Marquette's Turn the Ship Around, where he talks about, I mentioned it earlier, intent-based leadership. I spotted a problem, I intend to do this about it. Does anybody have a problem with it? Does anybody have a better suggestion or have I overlooked anything crucial? But the default is I have an intent to do it and unless somebody convinces, convinces me not to, I'm going to go ahead and do it. Rather than, oh, if nobody tells me what to do, I'll just sit and wait and do nothing. Okay. I lost the suitcase, so my suitcase was lost on my flight into London a few days ago. It took 11 hours to get it from the flight that brought it in to the company to deliver it to me. 11 hours. Somebody was just sitting there waiting. Nobody was looking after it in a proactive way. Nobody had the intent to satisfy me as the customer. Okay? So seek and provide input. And then final one is I still remember it. I read this book, Learning to Fly, about, I think, knowledge management at GP several years ago. And they talk about teams in the organization offering help on some of the stuff that they think they have done well and seeking help on some things that they are struggling with. Actively saying, guys, we're not very good with this. Can anybody help us? Now, how, how much trust could that generate in the organization? Okay. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to go to the last one. Now, this one is probably the emptiest. So this is about purpose. This is about commitment to that purpose without knowing what we are. Why are we here? It's very difficult to adjust. So, so Howard Schultz is the CEO of Starbucks and former owner of the Seattle Supersonics. And he said, for people, when you're surrounded by people who are passionate about the purpose, anything is possible. So I have Tell Stories, and this is another book that I very much like, called uh, Made to Stick by, Chip, uh, by uh, Heath Brothers, Chip and Dan. And they talk about telling stories, but they have an acronym of success. How many of you are, are, are familiar with success? And I always get confused. So tell simple, unexpected, concise, credible, emotional stories. And those will get your audience. This is very much to, goes back to, uh, to 
your talk yesterday about telling stories and us being hardwired to listen to stories and respond to stories. So this is how those stories should be. Okay. Um, and then again, behaviors, this may be a bit of a repetition, define some norms of behavior, observe them, model them, uh, provide feedback on them, but adjust them. Keep changing, keep adjusting, keep improving. Recognize contribution shows, uh, and show respect. I must be missing quite a lot here. But, you know, being the last one of the C's, I was running a bit out of patience. What am I missing? What, what, what are the crucial things I'm missing here? Anybody? I don't know. Okay. Does it mean it? Sorry. Reward. Uh, yeah, reward. As long as you don't jump into, oh my God, that means pay more. It doesn't necessarily, absolutely, sorry. Well, okay. recognize contribution, reward is kind of hidden in there, but you're absolutely right. Maybe I should call it out, reward. Celebration. Celebrate, yeah. even better. Yes. Celebrate. Celebrate, uh, celebrate failure, celebrate learning. Okay? Hmm? So that goes back to rewarding. How do we reward? No. What drives people? What mm. makes people contribute? And that's, that's the way. Where, where, where do people actually. <coughs> where does the movement come from? It comes from the internal intrinsic uh, motivation and, and the makeup of, the, of what they feel for themselves is important to them in different orders. And getting them hooked by working. And build it into these things, build it into stories, build it into all of the other stuff. Now, that's a good point. So, recognize interesting <laughs> Okay. So, that bring us to the, brings us to the end. And the statement I talked about earlier, think big, start small, move fast, <coughs> is not mine, but it is now because nobody else is claiming it. <laughs> um, and that's it from me. Thank you very much for coming and listening. <laughs> <laughs>